the extent of this talk that we were giving today, um, got lost a little bit in the translation to the program. What we're really focusing on is the capacity of quolls to respond to um, an increasing number of threats. Uh, and I would like to say, as Ovis mentioned, that I am talking on behalf of my colleagues, Lena Bay and Madeline Van Oten at Ames, and as well, a number of our postgraduate students, whom I'll mention as I go along. Now, we know that coral reefs have um, been building reefs, or sorry, corals have been building reefs for some 65 million years. The million dollar question, of course, is can they continue to build reefs into the future as we see a mounting number of challenges? Corals have evolved in environments where they are exposed to frequent and sometimes catastrophic disturbances, for instance, um, uh, cyclones and, and uh, storm events, desiccation, sedimentation, predator outbreaks, and so on. But in the face of all the challenges that we've been hearing about so eloquently from uh, Janice and Malcolm and, uh, and now Phil, the question is, can they survive the addition of all these climate-related impacts on the top of those natural disturbances? Will corals be pushed towards some sort of a tipping point where we see them um, be, be un undergo mass bleaching events as well as disease outbreaks and potentially switch to uh, a community that's no longer dominated by corals but something else, for example, macroalgae. Now we know that corals um, have uh, evolved an association with um, a symbiotic microalgae that lives in its cells, the Zizizale, and um, we know that they provide a, some very critical benefits to the health of the coral host. More recently, we also know that corals um, have evolved a, an association with an incredible diversity of bacteria that live in the, in the surface mucus, mucus layer as well as throughout the coral tissues. Uh, and that has given rise to the coral biont theory um, articulated by um, Boris Rower and Eugene Rosenberg, among others, uh, which states that corals have, do associate, and in fact the coral holobion comprises a diversity of eukaryotic and non-eukaryotic microorganisms. Um, common among those, as I said, have been symbiogenin, the endosymbiotic algae, which has been critical to the nutritional economy of the coral host. Um, and I'll also show you some uh, results of experiments that uh, they also affect the physiology of the coral host. Um, more recently, it's been shown that bacteria fix and pass nitrogen and carbon to the coral host, as well as accumulate trace nutrients, and they do produce uh, secondary metabolites like antibiotics that may help to exclude uh, undesirable microbiota from the, the coral host. We also know that there are a variety of the archaea and viruses, and in fact, it's uh, known that there's something like 30,000 viral types uh, associated with the coral colony. So in fact, it's quite likely that these uh, organisms also play a significant role in the health of the holobiont. So what we wanted to focus on are what are the options for the coral and holobiont to respond to climate change uh, and, and other sorts of environmental changes. Can they acclimatize to changing environments? What evidence is there for phenotypic plasticity in traits? Uh, can they adapt to changing environments? Um, are we seeing evidence of heritable variation? And the rest of the talk, I'll structure around uh, looking at options provided from the different members of the holobiont. So looking at options provided by uh, characteristics of the coral host, then the symbiogenian partner, and then finally the bacterial associates. And starting with first with the coral host then, and a very uh, visible color a trait that's color difference. We know that uh, this, this coral, uh, Acopra mellipora, uh, exists in three very distinct color morphs here. <coughs> Yellow, red, and green. Um, and uh, this is work that was done by a postgraduate student of ours, um, Alison Paley. And she did look at the distribution of these different color morphs, the red, the yellow, and the green, uh, at two different locations in the central section and the northern section of the DDR. And you can see there's a fairly consistent difference in the distribution of color morphs at these locations, with the, uh, note the red morph being much more common than the green morph. The question that arises then is this sort of variation, genetically determined or as well, is the color variation functional? 
Well, they also looked at um, the fluorescent proteins that are associated with these different color morphs. And what this shows is that um, if you look at the relative fluorescence um, for each of these morphs, the red morph, uh, yellow morph, and green morph, you can see that each morph actually contains quantities of these three different fluorescent proteins, the cyan, the green, and the red, though in very different quantities. So the red morph contains very uh, overall quite low levels of, of fluorescent proteins, whereas the green morph contains quite high levels of all the three fluorescent proteins. And somewhat um, fortunately, there was a natural that's called the Mauve Legion event at Legion Island this past summer. And um, Ali was able to follow um, the fate of a number of these different color morphs and found that, uh, in fact, um, the green morph actually bleached less than the other two morphs. So there was some evidence from this natural field experiment that color had uh, a functional role in terms of the thermal tolerance. And that uh, corroborated some results that she had from a, a, an experiment that she had done previously looking at, uh, again, the same species, the Tapa Meopora, um, and looking at the three different color morphs and stressing them, uh, the ambient stress and then a, a severe stress treatment. And just to point out briefly that in that high stress treatment at 32 degrees, um, the weakly fluorescent red morph, so remember the red morph was the most common, but it actually contained the least amount of fluorescent pigments. But the red morph bleached first, 100% of colonies bleached. There was poor recovery when she followed these through time. And uh, interestingly, absolutely no change in the concentration of fluorescent protein throughout the experiment. Uh, in contrast, that strongly fluorescent green morph, which is quite rare, remember, but it does have the greatest concentrations of each of the, the three different fluorescent pigments, it bleached last, 60, only 66% of the colonies bleached, it had good recovery following reheating, and moreover, there was a dramatic increase in the concentration of those fluorescent pigments um, during that recovery period. So um, seemingly suggesting that these color variations are connected to fluorescent proteins that actually do have a functional role uh, in thermal tolerance. And if so, then one question that arises, why aren't all colonies green? And um, she gained a little bit of insight into that question uh, when she was following through about uh, 150 colonies around uh, six sites in the Palm Islands over a period of about four or five months here, and found that <laughs> of those, three of the red colonies turned to green through time, so all remained healthy. Three green colonies turned to red, and also these, of course, these changes in color corresponded to changes in the pigment, con the concentrations of the fluorescent pigments. Um, and all of these three colonies actually um, were uh, showing signs of ill health, that they either had um, uh, signs of a disease, a white syndrome, or um, were actually very severely fragmented. So. One potential explanation is that these FTs are actually quite costly to produce, um, and thus only healthy colonies are able to produce some more FTs that enable them to exhibit that sort of a green coloration. So is this uh, potentially one mechanism for responding to, to thermal stress? Just to briefly recap then, so far for this coral host that we have seen variation in color and fluorescent protein concentration, so we are seeing evidence for phenotypic plasticity but it depends on the condition or the health of the coral. Um, but still, we still need to know a little bit more about the genetic variation, a basis for variation um, for some of these traits. And that's been the focus of some of Lena's work. Um, uh, she's been looking at uh, genetic variation in a number of traits. And the first experiment that um, she's done that's been recently published is actually looking at doing a common garden experiment, again with the Tapa Milipora, um, and sampling colonies from the inshore region here, as well as the offshore region here at Davies Reef. So sampling six colonies and then moving them to a common environment, in this case, the lab at, um, at Ames. And uh, just to recap here in terms of the conditions that they experienced, on the inshore reef, they have experienced lower light levels, but higher suspended particulate matter than on the offshore region. In the uh, lab, then they experienced lower light level again, and also lower levels of, of suspended particulate uh, organic matter. 
So after 10 days in this uh, aquaria at Ames, um, in which the colonies remained healthy throughout as um, assessed by uh, a measure of the health of the seas and colors, um, the, she looked at gene expression levels and compared them between the field, so the sample taken on day one, and the lab, the sample taken on day 10, and compared the expression in genes for expression for about eight, eight and a half thousand genes using the DNA measure array. And what emerges is uh, that, in fact, the uh, largest difference in gene expression uh, could be attributed to time. In other words, the difference between the sample taken um, in the field and the sample taken in the lab 10 days later. Uh, and in fact, uh, the least amount of that variation in gene expression could be attributed to the inshore versus the offshore location. Uh, looking at the actual genes that were differentially expressed then um, at between uh, the field and the lab, 114 genes differentially expressed, whereas only four were differentially expressed between the inshore and the offshore location. So most of the, the variation is between sampling times, and there's much more variation, in fact, at the colony level than between locations. So perhaps little evidence for adaptation here based on gene expression, so it must be borne in mind that these two different locations are not um, dramatically different in terms of their geographic separation. Uh, this is an example of one of the, the heat map generated in this experiment then, and just um, uh, briefly you can sort of get an idea of what's going on with looking at the color patterns. Green indicates that the genes were upregulated, and red that the gene expression was downregulated. Uh, this is looking at here are the samples from the field, and then these the samples from the lab for inshore versus offshore corals in these columns here. And one thing that uh, becomes clear is that there, there was more variation in gene expression in the field. Um, and also, going from the field to the lab, um, there was a much greater um, evidence of downregulation of genes. And in particular, there was downregulation of a few of the genes, and quite interestingly, the fluorescent proteins of greater than threefold going from the field to the lab. Looking now just at what those genes actually represent, um, this is the, um, what they, they match to in terms of whether they're um, uh, involved with metabolism and these various other functions. And uh, what becomes clear here is that the greatest uh, number of genes differentially expressed had to do with metabolism, some 40% of those genes, uh, as well as ones involved with environmental information processing and uh, some unclassified ones. Looking at then comparison of genes that were upregulated versus downregulated, and you can see that some 50% of the genes were involved with metabolism were downregulated. Um, so this does provide some evidence to acclimation, at least to the, to the lab environment. Now, why would most of these genes be downregulated in response to moving into that lab environment? And a clue, some clue arises when looking at total lipid content. This shows uh, mean lipid then at, for the sample selected from the inshore versus the offshore location from day one in the, in the field to day 10 in the lab. And you can see there was a significant decline in lipids for the inshore corals, but uh, much less of a decline for the offshore corals. Uh, and it may mean that these inshore corals, being used for a much higher level of suspended particulate matter, may be adapted to much higher levels of heterotrophies. And so going into that lab environment has meant that they are under some sort of a nutritional challenge. Um, the downregulation of the fluorescent proteins um, suggests that they may be adapted to a higher light level um, at both the inshore and the offshore sites. But interestingly enough, from Ali's work, it may be that um, the um, the downregulation of fluorescent proteins may be a consequence of um, not having the nutritional resources to produce those fluorescent proteins. So part two for the coral host, then we can we have seen that corals can change gene expression in response to environmental change. So we are seeing evidence of significant plasticity. Um, there is greater variation in, this, in gene expression at the colony level than between sites. 
So we still don't have much of a handle in terms of variation at somatic level, um, and that's required to uh, assess the potential for adaptation. Now just looking quickly at the Symbiogenian partner, um, looking at pictures like this, it's clear that um, here's the same coral associated with different genetic types of zizintelli, what we call a B zizintelli type versus B2. And um, it's quite striking that the corals with B have not bleached, whereas those with B2 have bleached. Um, so there is some suggestion that the bleaching response of a coral can vary with the symbiogenian type, and thus that there may be some potential for acclimatization of the holobiontinon rather than adaptation by shuffling and switching it, the, the partners. <coughs> and we've been looking for some time now at the system with broadcast spawning corals because these sorts of corals have um, horizontal transmission of the zizintelli, so the eggs are released without zizintelli from the parent. Um, and when the juvenile settles, then they're free of zizintelli and acquire the zizintelli from the field through time. So this provides um, a, a mechanism for actually exploring um, if different genotypes, genetic types can be taken up and actually provide options for the coral holobiont to respond to environmental change. We, sh we showed previously that um, when you look at the uh, juveniles that have been experimentally infected with either C1 or D, um, for two different species that associate with different zizintelli types, typically as adults, regardless of those two types that they typically associate with, both species as a juvenile grew about twice as fac fast when they were associated with C1 as with D. So that was the, true for both. And more recently, um, uh, an isotope study um, of the one of another one of our students showed that, in fact, um, symbiogenin C1, the type that causes faster growth, actually translocates about two times more carbon than the other zizintelli types of the host. So it helps to explain what we're seeing there. But we wanted then to look at the role of the environment, um, as well as this sort of relationship between symbiogenian type and host hold up in different locations. And uh, this is some work now of another one of our students, Josh Myers. And uh, he looked at um, juveniles that again had been experimentally infected with two different clades, this time uh, with B and C1 again. Um, and juveniles from the magnetic island, the tailet magnetic island, juveniles from the southern GBR here down in the Keppel <coughs> were again retained in the Keppel Island. And then the, uh, uh, there were another set of juveniles uh, that were translocated uh, from Magnetic Island to Keppel and similarly from Keppel back to Magnetic Island. And then the growth of those juveniles were monitored uh, through time. And what um, interestingly comes through here now is that again, if you look at the juveniles with C1 versus D from both um, the Magnetic Island and Keppel Island sites of, of origin um, and grown out at Magnetic Island, they both grew better with C1 again than D, as I had shown previously, and moreover, they survived much better when they were associated with C1 versus D. Um, but interestingly, when these uh, coral juveniles that have been infected from the Keppel Islands and maintained at the Keppel Islands, in fact, corals growing with D and C1 both grew about the same, so that we don't see this, this difference in the impact of the symbiogenium on the coral host in terms of its growth. And in fact, they survived much better with D now than they did with C1. So we're seeing a switch in um, the effect of the symbiogenium in the same corals, but at different locations. So in fact, location also matters in this, in this whole equation. So um, the interactions between the host and the symbiogenian type are quite complex and involve an interaction with the environment as well. <coughs> Taking that one step further and looking at uh, the impact of the symbiogenian type on thermal tolerance then, and this is looking at a measure again of zizintelli health, um, this time the higher here on this scale of um, mean um, excitation pressure over PS2 uh, means that the coral is more sensitive to stress. So it's actually doing worse here than it is here. Um, 
And again, uh, so this is suggesting that corals with C1 have lower thermal tolerance than corals with C2. Um, for, uh, this is for Atropha millipora um, in some of these Keppel Islands. <coughs> but it's never simple, it's always complex. And uh, a, a study of uh, another student of ours, David Abrego, who looked at um, the, uh, an, another species of coral, Atropha tenuis, which as an adult typically associates with uh, Syndigenium C1. And this time, looking at that high temperature treatment, the coral does worse with C than C1. So the complete opposite. So here we're seeing uh, signs that host factors also play a role in thermal tolerance. So it's not going to be a simple matter that there is one syndigenium trade that is better at providing thermal tolerance than another. Um, in terms of understanding um, the uh, onset of specificity of the symbiogenium partnership for the coral, uh, again, this is work of David Abrego, and it shows that for uh, Atropha tenuis, and uh, these are for coral juveniles that have been put back out into the field and allowed to be infected naturally in the field. Um, it takes quite some time, in fact, before coral juveniles start to um, develop the symbiotic association typical of the adults. So over here, adults at Magnetic Island typically are dominated by Symbiogenium C1. Juveniles at Magnetic Island initially are dominated by Symbiogenium D. And it's not until somewhere here about two and a half years that they start to be, that symbiosis becomes dominated by Symbiogenium C1, which is the same as the adults. And similarly, this is looking at two different cohorts, again, at Magnetic Island. It takes nearly two and a half years before they start to become dominated by the adult Symbiogenium type. Um, interestingly, um, the uh, juveniles from Baby Grief and Orpheus Islands, which normally associate with, as adults with a different one, Symbiogenium type, C2, they existed at Magnetic Island for two and a half to three and a half years and never acquired the uh, symbiogenium type characteristic of the adult. So I think um, it may be that that a particular symbiogenium type just was not available at that particular habitat to take up. But nevertheless, these juveniles survived for more than two years <coughs> with a non-homologous type. Um, uh, and it may be that the, the change in symbiogenium type uh, we thought initially it might be associated with the change to reproductive maturity, but in fact, um, it looks like it's probably more to do with change in growth form, that by the time they're starting to become three-dimensional, that's when they're starting to switch to the other type. So a, a quick recap um, that um, both symbiogenium types and environment effects pull about fitness. The symbiogenium type and host factors affect thermal tolerance. Um, coral juveniles can take two to three years to establish that typical adult partnership. The juveniles can persist for at least two and a half years, though, without the homologous type. So we are seeing um, that holobionts are able to respond to the environment through the association of the symbiogenium, but the sorts of interactions that are going on are quite complex. And, of course, the big question is, what is the long-term potential for symbiogenium types to provide new options in responding to rapid environmental changes? Um, I wanted to also point out um, that uh, genetic diversity of the symbiogenium and connectivity between populations also contributes to the resilience of the symbiogenium partner. The work of another student of ours, Emily Howells, working on a soft coral Fumularia and looking at the population genetics of the symbiogenium at sites up and down the Great Barrier Reef here, 11 in fact, and looking at the population variation using microsatellite loci, shows that all populations are genetically differentiated at all these distances, so there's evidence of limited connectivity amongst these populations of symbiogenium living in the soft coral host. There's uh, greater genetic separation among than within regions, so um, between these three, these different regions. Um, so there's dis poor dispersal potential of the symbiogenium partner, and the population structure is correlated um, 
with key cir circulation patterns in terms of particularly cost and shelf for uh, cost shelf patterns of distribution. So it looks like there's fairly low levels of dispersal that um, are most likely accomplished through hydrodynamic transport. Um, moreover, if we looked at um, the genetic diversity of some of these corals on the inshore versus the, whoops, the offshore, um, on the mid-shelf mid and offshore reefs, and um, what becomes clear is that the genetic diversity is about one and a half times lower on the inshore compared to the offshore. This may reflect the fact that there was bleaching. We know definitely from records that about 72% of the Stingillaria bleached in 1998 here at Oysters Island, and it, there was the 10 degree greater bleaching on the inshore reefs. So it may be that this widespread bleaching that affected the inshore reefs have been responsible for this loss of genetic diversity. But what it means though, is that there's a limited capacity of these Symbiogenian populations to respond or adapt to environmental change through, um, you know, after they've gone through these sorts of bleaching and disturbance episodes, and that um, the Symbiogenian populations are going to be susceptible to loss of diversity as climate changes. Lastly, um, I just wanted to um, say a little bit about the bacterial associates. This is a work that we're just starting to have a look at and looking at um, the uh, bacterial associated with three different species of corals at three sites. Um, and what this just shows briefly is that three different culture independent techniques did show that there was conserved microbiota, if you just look at the colors that represent different types of bacteria for different species of corals, that these microbiota are conserved within a coral species and also between closely related species. So we are seeing evidence that the holobiont is also comprised of bacterial associates, which are specific for at least closely related species. Um, if we look at differences though between locations here between Magnetis and Orsers Island, um, we are seeing differences in some of the um, dominant bacterial wabotypes at these three sites. So again, we're seeing complexity in the interaction between the microbiota and the environment. Um, so just basically, there is enormous complexity in microbial partnerships. Microbial symbionts do provide options for acclimatization through shuffling and switching. Um, also, we have to think that there is a potential for rapid evolution because these microbial symbionts have such sh short generation times, but there are a huge number of unknowns in all of this. And um, I think that um, as any number of people here today um, have stated and will continue to state that um, if we continue on our current tra trajectory in terms of uh, emissions of greenhouse gases, that we may be faced with a very real prospect of saying so long and thanks for all the fish to our coral reefs. Um, we do know from some of our work that there, there is potential for adaptation and acclimatization of the various partners in the, the holobiont. But if we want to see coral reefs functioning like this, then there is urgent necessity for all of us to do our bit. Thank you very much. That's all